Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Chicago, 1965, by Rhonda C. Pointer. So Jake got out of prison the day before and jumped on the Greyhound for as far as the bus ticket would take him. Luckily for him, it was Chicago, because Shy's always been an interesting place to be stranded, make a living, start over. He rolled the loop for a few hours, smoked as many Paul Malls as he could, and stopped at a pool hall to play eight ball with a couple of kids even younger than he was. He'd gotten out on his 21st birthday and won two dollars. All in all, a productive day. Over on Kinsey, Annie was coming out of the coffee shop where she worked, about to have 30 minutes to herself before she had to be back to serve more blue plate specials and refill the ketchup bottles. She paused on the sidewalk, started to her left, and then turned around. Her brake errands were now behind her, but she headed the opposite direction. And they met, literally passing one another, glancing, moving on. Then Jake stopped, and he too turned around. Hey! Annie knew when she acknowledged his yelp that that would be it, and everything was about to change. She pivoted and smiled. Hey, yourself. Jake crossed the distance between the two of them. I'm Jake, and I just got out of prison. He beamed, his night black hair falling across his forehead into his eyes. Robbed a bank when I was 15, went down as an adult. Annie didn't pause. She didn't think about that. She knew some nice guys weren't nice guys, and so maybe some bad guys weren't all that bad, or could be changed. She nodded. I'm Annie. I'm from Montana. Came here on the Greyhound. Jake looked at her, over her shoulder, up at the sunlight bouncing down. He looked back into Annie's green eyes. So, you want to get married? Sure, Annie replied. And then they both began to walk up Kinsey, away from the coffee shop and the pool hall, and neither stopped again. There was no reason to reconsider, hesitate. It was meant to be. She'd tell people for the next forty years it was a life sentence. It was turning the other way on the avenue that morning, because she knew without knowing. It was hell, and hard. And a few times they each bought Greyhound tickets out, but then they'd buy tickets back. It was... something else. Mom! Mom, River says, looking up from his computer screen. Is that how I should put it down, just like you're saying it? Jess stood at the kitchen sink, rinsing the last of the snack dishes. She looked through the window to the backyard, watched the wind blow around the garden, thought that for a brief second she saw her parents again. Yes, just like that. Your teacher wanted an example of the word. She's got it. Fate. 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 Anybody who didn't believe in it, well, they're just fools. Clueless, silly fools. Heaven, Maybe, by Jesse Glass. What is this place? I asked her, and she told me the magic word, as I looked at the snake pills that waited in plastic bags for one touch of the match to unlock a ten-foot boa of ash from each one, and I saw the deer grazing before the glowing mountain's tapestry, and the Jesus at the Last Supper purple and gold tapestry handmade in Mexico, hanging beside the picture of President Kennedy in the gilded tin frame, and the flags of the state's ashtray and the Go Navy, and the Go Colts, and the Orioles Cap, and the Pull String Spider, and Devil and Skeleton Puppets. Oh, babe, Harry Dice, and gorilla hands hanging from the wall, and I saw the red boxes full of fun, made in China, the Devil Mask, the Creepy Hand, and the Easy Book of Jokes, the Squirt Flowers, all sizes and colors, the Fake Fried Egg, the Mystery Surprise Grab Bags, the X-Ray Specs, the Plastic Handcuffs, the Balsa Billy Club and Tin Slide Whistles and Fart Cushions, and Fly in an Ice Cube next to the Exploding Cigar, next to the Fake Vomit and Dog Dew, next to the Squeeze It Yourself Worm and the Cigar by the Foot Long He-Man, Real Cigar all in the Glass Case with the Finger Guillotine, the Magic Levitating Mummy, the Magnetic Dogs that Sniff Each Other's Butts, 
the light bulb that lights by itself and answers your every question, the throw your voice surprise your friends device, the electric yes no truth detector, and the deluxe electric yes no truth detector. And what is this place? I asked. She that I love more than my teenage mother, who cried on the phone. She of the house dress, of the pie face, the double chin, the smile, the white hair, the old flats, the false teeth, the eczema on the hands, and behind one ear. She of the kiss and good night and a nightlight, of the tickle my back till I slept, of the big purse and the couple of dollars, and the hamburgers made just like I like them, and the cold cokes and my favorite toy. In the big house that was always quiet, and I looked down at the peanut shells, the cigar butts, the candy wrappers, the old coupon papers from the Sunday sun crushed by high heels, sandals, boots, and shoes. And I looked up, and the thin man with his sleeve pinned up, and the thinnest neck had a rubber mouse running over his hand and up and down his shirt front with the grease spots on it. And a plastic frog was swallowing a fly over and over on a felt card table, as the tiny blue mouse ran over his wrist like it was a thing made of water. And it was miraculous. It was easy. It was simple. To learn. Amaze your friends, he was whispering through a throat microphone in a voice too high and too low. And a crowd had gathered to watch the wind-up frog. And the little blue mouse now kissing the man's cheek, hiding in his pocket. And to watch it all, I stood on my toes and tried to look around the others. And what's he doing now? I asked, and the woman I loved even more than my teenage father because she was quiet and kind and we watched Mitch Miller on the television together and she didn't slam one door or throw a plate of food because it tasted bad, told me what the mouse was doing and that the frog was slowing down a little and that the mouse had a very, very thin string tied to the buttonhole on the one-armed man's shirt and it must have been difficult for him to have it tied there like that and she told me these things and I believed every word. And I wasn't disappointed, and I asked, what is this place? And she laughed, and I laughed, because we already knew. Hello there, welcome to No Extra Words, the flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh, I'm your producer and editor. We started the conversation about Mother's Day last week. We're continuing it today, and I'm going to be honest and tell you, I don't know entirely what to say. I don't want to get into a lot of personal stuff, but I will leave it at, I personally have a really complicated relationship with Mother's Day, and I don't think I'm the only one. This is a really lovely holiday. Everybody out there has had a mother at some point, and so honoring those who came before us is a really valuable thing. But families do not look like they do in TV commercials for Hallmark cards. They just don't. And so holidays that make family happiness their center core, I think, can create some real rough edges for people who are struggling. And when we do holiday episodes here on the show, we kind of play with that tension between what a holiday is supposed to look like and what it looks like in the real world. We did that on Thanksgiving for sure with what thankfulness really does look like and feel like in the nitty gritty where the rubber meets the road. And that's really what we have today. Today's episodes do celebrate mothers and do celebrate motherhood. Not all mothers go by the name of mom and not all mothering moments are pretty and glamorous. But it is about the act of becoming a mom, the act of mothering, and the act of being mothered, and what that looks like in four brief snapshots. I think it is a celebration, but I think it's a celebration with an understanding that every single moment isn't completely shrouded in joy. And especially those transition moments can be rough as edges scrape together. Um, I think the way that Jesse Glass does his stream of consciousness story in the story you just heard heaven maybe the idea of family as an illusion is a really really good one but there's also a core of complete gratitude and complete passion for this person who is raising him and is providing that security and giving those answers so today is meant to be a celebration it's not meant to be melancholy but it is meant to be real and four moments of family life talking about that family relationship in all of its blemished and mucked up glory. 
And I'm also going to end today with a special guest who helped put me a little more in the mood for my Mother's Day. So I hope you will stay tuned to hear all of that. Please enjoy the rest of today's stories and we will see you next week here on the No Extra Words podcast. Danger in the summer moon above. It is a dangerously clear night. Too many stars and a razor-sharp moon. Me and Terry hop over fences and crawl on our bellies through backyards. Fresh mown grass pinpricks through my t-shirt. We call ourselves the Danger Twins. Our faces and arms smeared with dirt from Terry's mom's garden. Terry's 11, a year older than me. He leads the way. We crouch in the shadows, away from back porch light bulbs, burning yellow through mosquito clouds, holding our breaths perfectly still at the slam of a screen door, avoiding patio chairs and plastic pools, passing unseen beneath windows lit only by a milky blue TV glow. I started being friends with Terry at the beginning of summer, a week after my mother died. She had tuberculosis. When I told Terry about that, he just shook his head and frowned. Tough break, man. We went riding on our bikes and later met up with another kid we both knew from school. This kid was telling us how his mother had just come home from the hospital with a new baby sister. Terry put his arm around me and explained to the kid, his mom just kicked the bucket. (laughs) It was a weird thing to say. In one way it hurt, even though I knew Terry wasn't trying to be mean. But in another way, it put a real picture in my head. A way that described how I was feeling. I could see this metal bucket lying on its side. The hard curve of the rim showing the emptiness of it. That hollow feeling in the pit of my stomach. After that, we spent practically every day together. This way, Terry whispers. We wriggle through an opening of some high shrubs. A twig scratches hard against my arm. Shit! Shut up, you knob, he hisses in my ear. You want her to hear us? I have no idea where we are. Some backyard and it's real dark. Only one window has a light on. There's a woman sitting in front of a mirror brushing her hair. She's wearing some kind of bathrobe. Her hair is long and red, and she brushes it very slowly. This is the woman Terry has told me about, the cashier at the supermarket who smiles at him. I can see her lips moving like she's talking to herself in the mirror. It's so quiet, I can only hear the two of us breathing. The woman stops brushing her hair and looks out the window. She isn't looking at us, but it's like she knows we're there. I feel another kind of hollowness inside me the woman moves away from the window the light goes off let's go terry says but i don't move and he puts his arm around me i can't stop shaking come on man it's okay above the house the moon has turned us both into shadows About Me Being a Big Brother by Audra Kerr Brown Uncle Rufus from 5B spends the night and makes bratwurst for breakfast. We stand at the kitchen window eating the bratwurst out of rolled cones of newspaper and watching the snow pile up on the fire escapes and power lines below. Uncle Rufus is not our uncle. He's just some old man who smells like dirty shorts and comes over for Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners. And when Mom needs a favor... Like last night, after she got the birthing pains and had to go to the hospital. Congratulations, he says. He clinks his mug against mine, and Hawaiian punch splatters on the floor like the blood when Mom's water broke. He says he got a phone call from her in the middle of the night, and then he tells me your name, your weight, and the time you were born. I sop up the spilled punch with the toe of my sock and try to picture you like the babies on television, but all I can see is the frightened face of the bird Mom pulled out of the kitchen vent last spring. 
Uncle Rufus hands me a sack lunch of cashews and red licorice. You'll get used to it, he says, and I know he's not talking about the sack lunch, but about me being a big brother. You'll have someone to hold under the blankets when you fart. He laughs, but I'm thinking of how I'd cried when Mom wouldn't let me keep that bird. The sound of her voice that told me to hush up, and when I said I couldn't, the sting of her hand across my cheek that made it so. Uncle Rufus now helps me into my boots, zips up my snowsuit, catching the tip of my chin in its teeth, and sends me to school. On the way, I toss the cashews to the crows and bend the licorice ropes to form letters in the snow. When finished, I stand a while and stare at your name. To get used to it, I guess. Hi, podcast listeners. This is Chris again, and since we're finishing up our celebration of Mother's Day today, I wanted to bring on a special guest. Can you say hi? Hi. What is your name? Two. What is your name? What in? What's your name? What in? Say, I'm James. I'm James. James, did we celebrate Mother's Day yesterday? Yeah. Can you say Happy Mother's Day? Happy Mother's Day. What did you do for Mom on Mother's Day? Happy Mother's Day, Grandma. Did you say Happy Mother's Day to Grandma? Did you give Mama a flower? Flower. Flower. And how old are you, James? Two. Two. Can you say bye-bye, podcast listeners? Bye-bye, button. You want to come back and talk on the microphone like Mama again soon? More. <laughs> Maybe more talk in the microphone. Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.